we'll start there. And I'm Peter Nerksey, and I represent a group called Bay Area Computer History Perspectives, and that's me and Jeannie Trichel, also Sun Microsystems. And the two of us have been organizing a history series of talks for almost six years now. And in the last two years, we've been joined by the Computer Museum History Center, which, as you can see looking around you, is the world's largest collection of historical computer hardware. I was thinking how in our first year of talks, back six years ago, we had a couple of talks on Irma, which was the first computer built here in the Bay Area. It was built at SRI in Menlo Park as part of a project for Bank of America. Though Irma, back then, 1954, it was still a prototype stage, and after they finished the prototype, they tore it down and then built a totally different computer for the final commercial application, which was installed in 1959. So if you think back then, 45 years ago, 1954, what was going on in the Bay Area? There was some Irma work, and what was going on down in L.A.? Well, Joniak here was up and running, and I think the standards Western computer was running, and that was probably the first computer built in California. Well, the balance of power and computing 45 years ago was rather down towards L.A., and <laughs> it's, uh, I'm kind of fortunate we may say that uh, Silicon Valley asserted itself and reclaimed preeminence. So that's part of the benefits of history, looking back these relatively enormous periods of time in computing history, like 40, 45, 50 years, and seeing how things have changed. So the program tonight is on yeah, Joniak, which was built in Santa Monica and first uh, started running 45 years ago. So I'll turn the mic over to Gordon Bell, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, actually, I was at the uh, Manchester celebration in June, and it was the 50th, and we're just 50 years into computing yeah, 50 years ago, uh, the first stored program computer ran. Uh, what's particularly significant about the the talk today uh, is that first we have the G the Joniac here, and it's a member of the the famed IES family, or it's a true von Neumann machine, and whatever that meant, whether von, whether it was named because von Neumann wrote the first report on stored program computer, or it was a parallel machine, and everybody else was building serial machines. I hope we'll find out uh, the theory about how it ended up that way. Von Neumann. What? It was von Neumann. Ah. Please, I, it was von Neumann. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, anyway, it's, it was a member of... of those machines, the Prince, the Princeton, the IES machines, uh, which included ILIAC, Celiac, Wysac, Maniac, uh, and a few others, um, and running in March 54. Now I'd like to talk about the people who did that. Uh, I'll start with Paul Armour, uh, who was the, uh, as it ran between 47 and 68, uh, as, I guess, programmer, head of computer, and, and eventually head of the computer science and, uh, sort of the project uh, or overall uh, department head at the time. Uh, he's been at uh, uh, Stanford and directing the copy uh, at the Computer Center and uh, has been a, a member of the Babbage Institute and, uh, and doing uh, various other things. Uh, Willis Ware is the, uh, uh, was, was the designer uh, of the machine, was uh, spent was spent uh, 46 to 51 at uh, IES, and uh, then came uh, to Rand Corporation via uh, North American Aviation, and uh, was there from has been there from 52 to 92, and is in fact still a member or a consultant at at Rand. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, a fellow of the uh, IEEE, and uh, uh, AAAS and the ACM, and uh, he's also a, a, a wrote uh, a, a series, one of the first logic logic design books. Uh, uh, Bill Gunning uh, was a Joniac project engineer. Uh, he and he came uh, to uh, and was at Rand uh, and transferred to Rand uh, from Douglas in. Uh, and was there from 47 to 54, uh, 
uh, eventually came to the Bay Area, and I uh, ran into him a couple of times at Xerox Park. He was part of the DEC Intel uh, 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 Xerox relationship that uh, that uh, created uh, Ethernet. Uh, he was one of the key people who made it work, um, and then uh, he's now a, a consultant at uh, at Park. Uh, and then uh, now uh, Bort, uh, Mort Bernstein, uh, who's a Johnny X software developer, uh, have, have to get that last, you know, software comes, uh, as Ken Olson was uh, fond of saying, uh, uh, good software comes, uh, good software comes from heaven when you, when you have good hardware. So we know if you, <laughs> so, so, so we, uh, but and so it wasn't until a year or two ago that this explained how you get bad uh, bad software. Uh, so there may be some wisdom in in all of that. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Mort was at, at uh, got his uh, did mathematics at the University of Pittsburgh, then was at uh, at Rand from '54 to '63. Has been at uh, was at IBM for a while and then went to. The Systems Development Corporation was part of the the um, programming of the FSQ uh, seven, the, the, the Sage system. So let's let, let's hear from the the team now. <laughs> who's, who, who's leading? <laughs> uh, Paul's going to go first. Paul's Paul. So we're yeah. you had him in the right order. Right. <laughs> I've got somebody's water bottle here. It's yours. No, it's, it's, it's been it's been supplied. Oh, that's a spare, Paul. Okay. Great. Okay, so close. Good. Oh, I, 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 I can't help but I have, for the record, uh, need to say. When it was running the open shop system, uh, JOS, the machine that re, uh, that replaced that was a PDP six uh, that I <laughs> that I <laughs> I helped design. <laughs> Major mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you tell us why later. Tell us. Yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to uh, say a little bit about the uh, the early history. Uh, particularly to uh, explain to some of you who may not know the origins of the RAND Corporation, uh, which I want to talk about briefly. Uh, but actually, I had essentially very little to do with the, with the Johnny Act. Uh, in, in the very early days, it was the so other folks over there and not us software types uh, who were worrying about that machine. So... Uh, it uh, the the one aspect that uh, I'm concerned about uh, covering is that uh, a number of people, uh, Bill for one, George Brown, John Williams, Willis, uh, made a trip to the East Coast uh, when we were considering. Uh, what did we want to do about meeting the incredible problems we saw in that we needed a lot more and a lot more reliable computing than we had available at the time. Uh, and one of the, uh, the things which happened on that trip, well, there was a notion that maybe we could get IBM to, uh, to build a machine for us. Uh, they told us that no, they weren't going to build one, uh, and so we came back and uh, decided we were, were going to have to build it ourselves. Uh, I was off in another group at this time, so I don't really know much about that, that trip and what went on, but uh, maybe some of the others in the group can, can say more about it. Uh, the RAND Corporation got started uh, <coughs> at the end of... of World War II, when uh, General Arnold, then Chief of Staff of the Army Air Corps, and if you remember the history of our armed services, 
the uh, the Air Force is a very late comer to the uh, to the armed forces, and during World War II, it was the Army Air Corps, uh, and then there was the the Navy as the the second arm, and it was only after World War II that uh, the Air Force became a, a third member of the of the armed services. But anyway, uh, towards the end of World War II, General Hap, Hap Arnold who was the chief of staff of the Army Air Corps, got concerned about the fact that they had all kinds of scientists from the academic world working for them on their research problems. Uh, and these people were all dead intent on returning to the academic world as soon as the war was over. So he began worrying about what he was going to do to essentially attract this kind of, of talent to the problems of the then Army Air Corps. Uh, he apparently talked with a number of uh, uh, e executives from industry and with a number of the academics who were doing this work. Uh, and out of this came a, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, that a military installation was not the right model, that the model that was much more appropriate was an academic model. Uh, and also the fact that it would be very important that the uh, scientists themselves have very much of a say about what they were working on. Uh, so out of this came the notion, all right, we need a nonprofit organization, uh, and we'll hire some of these people, and that'll work. Uh, the thing that didn't work about that model, oh, uh, eventually a contract was given to the Douglas Aircraft Corporation. To, a contract was given to the Douglas Aircraft Corporation uh, to do what was called Project RAND. There were two notions about how they came up with the letters R A N D, one of which was research and development but the more popular one was research and no development. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this contract was given to Douglas, uh, and that didn't work at all, because the people on Project Rand essentially needed to know what all the <coughs> aircraft companies and other organizations like that were doing in the way of, of work. Uh, and... A Boeing employee was not about to tell uh, an employee of the Douglas Corporation what the hell he was working on. So uh, quickly the, the plan was changed such that it's got to be a nonprofit organization with no connections with any commercial company. And uh, the Ford Foundation was conned into putting up a big chunk of money, and the Rand Corporation came into being. Uh, I want to say one quick word about that, that history. Uh, I wasn't there at the time, uh, and consequently what I've just said is very much a personal impression of the world at that time and might be quite wrong. Uh, so the, the, the contract was moved from Douglas to the, the newly formed nonprofit might say a bit about uh, some of the things that, that changed at that time. The, the notion was that you have to, in this organization, have good salaries and good fringe benefits. And uh, our early fringe benefits were that we had four weeks of vacation. And the first year you got four weeks. It was not anything that built up over time. Uh, further, we had from the academic world the TIA CREP retirement plan. Uh, and in the very early days of RAND, when we flew, we flew first class. So the, uh, the fringe benefits were nice. Uh, further in relation to my comment about the individuals having something to say about what they were working on, was that when a senior scientist was hired, in essence he was told, we've just bought your time for N years, go off and spend it in the best interest of the Air Force, or 
at that time the Army Air Corps. Uh, and I think this was was just incredibly in, important uh, in the early history of RAN and in the fact that it uh, that it worked out well. I used to often describe uh, the way RAND worked was that each year the uh, the Air Force said to RAND, because eventually it became the Air Force, uh, said to RAND, here's a bag of money, go off and spend it in our best interest. And then the RAND management divided this money into N bags, where N was somewhere between 6 and 12, and said, go off and spend this in the best interest of the Air Force. And I think added, at least in the way we operated, in the best interest of the Air Force and science. Uh, and I think for, for a number of the things that we did, that was a, a very key point. Uh, and indeed, if there was a proposal that we work on something that uh, maybe its immediate advantage to the Air Force was not particularly obvious, that if it was good for science, we felt we could do it. Uh, okay. Now I want to turn a, a little bit to the early days of computing that ran. Uh, I was hired by Cecil Hastings in the summer of 1947 to operate a desk calculator. Uh, and there were lots of people around RAND uh, in, in that position. Uh, the president of RAND at that time was Frank Kohlbaum. Uh, the number two man was J.D. Goldstein, Goldie. And John D. Williams was head of the math department. Uh, reporting to him was George Brown, who headed the computer science department. And there was also a, a math department. Numerical analysis. Numerical analysis. Did I say computer science? Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> and George Brown has been on my back about that about four or five times in the past. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> uh, Cecil and his group of desk calculator operators uh, reported to George Brown. George Brown left Rand in uh, 1952, and I succeeded him. And Willis Ware became associate department head. And then we did, uh, Willis and I, something that around Rand was known as the hat trick because we traded hats. So Willis has also been head of the computer science department for many years, although the department doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> the biggest problem with desk calculator operation is that it was not only very slow, but it was incredibly error prone. If you think about someone sit sitting at a desk calculator, he gets a result, he copies it onto his worksheet, and then sometime later he's got a punch it back into the keyboard. You know, every one of those times something can go wrong and an error introduced. Uh, of course, you can come up with some examples of being able to do this well uh, with meticulous care. I mean, for example, uh, at least those of us who are operating desk calculators in those days were well acquainted with uh, t t mathematical tables that had been produced by, of all people, the Works Progress Administration. Some of you probably don't even know the initials of WPA, but it was essentially a government way of trying to create jobs during the Depression. But they produced a number of mathematical tables that, as far as I know, nobody's ever found an error in. I suppose there are some, but... Uh, punch card computing was a lot better. Uh, and actually, when I arrived at RAN, we, the department was already involved in punch card uh, computing at with Douglas equipment. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we uh, ordered a lot of punch card equipment. Uh, I guess the first calculator we got was a 602. Uh, and this was just an incredibly better way of, of getting computing done. Uh, I uh, eventually got out of the desk calculator business by going to Cecil Hastings and say, hey, when you open our own installation, I want to work with that stuff. Uh, but one of the serious shortcomings of this kind of gear was that essentially the only way you could really do it was uh, in, in a parallel fashion. 
Think of payroll. You, you've got a card for every employee, and first of all, for every employee, you multiply hours times rate, and then eventually you do the calculations for each employee, uh, calculations of taxes due and other deductions, and finally you print out a check. But until you start printing checks, you haven't completed the work for any one of the employees. Now, this doesn't bother you worth a damn when you're doing payroll. But suppose that you're trying to maximize a, a function of five or six variables. What do you do when you have this kind of a situation? Well, you pick out a number of combinations of these five variables, and you start calculating. And you, until you finish the last step, you've essentially got nothing on any of the cases. And when you do this, of say, trying to maximize a function like that, 90%, when you get through, 90% of the results you've got you can't possibly be interested in. You know, it was often in parameter space that didn't result, bring in the results you wanted at all. So you wasted a lot of time. So not only was it slow, but you wasted a lot of time. Uh, this situation really turned around when IBM came up with the uh, uh, card program calculator, which in which the punch cards ran through the, the drive of a tabulator, and in each card was one program step. That meant that you essentially, in this instance of trying to maximize a function, when you started a given case, you worked, the machine worked entirely on that case until you were finished with it. So when you begin to learn something about the results from this, you don't calculate all these cases that you threw out the last time. So literally that was a marvelous change. Uh, sort of a, a brief side story on this. Uh, one of the first programs that we had uh, did on the CPC involved uh, computing uh, missile trajectories. And we were given five cases which had been done and supposedly checked on desk calculator off uh, equipment. Uh, when we ran them, it turned out that not a single one of those cases had been done correctly. They weren't drastically wrong. I mean, people could, I suppose, see that something has gone wrong and back up a few steps. And, but none of them was correct. Okay, now, since I'm trying to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the world way back then, uh, we were all essentially feeling an incredible incredible demand to expand our capability, you know, not once or twice, but orders of magnitude. Uh, further, we wanted it to be a good deal more reliable. Uh, and I'd like to quote some uh, uh, figures that uh, Bill Gunning came up with for me. Uh, in mid-1953, RAND programming programmers were using the standards Western Automatic Computer at UCLA. That's standards as in Bureau of Standards. Uh, you, what the machine was called a SWAC. And our programmers did a memory dump so that they could start over if necessary every minute. Each minute on SWAC was equivalent to about eight hours on the card program calculator. The card program calculator had a mean time between errors of about eight hours. Later, SWAC improved to about 10 minutes mean time between failures. So one of the goals of Joniac was that it be reliable. And by early 1956, its mean time between failures was greater than 100 hours. By this time, by the the time that Joniak began to operate the uh, ENIAC effort in the East and of course the work of von Neumann and all at Princeton, which had such an impact on us that we called the machine the Joniak, uh, was one of the things that was going on in the world. There was SWAC, as I mentioned earlier, at UCLA. Uh, incidentally, von Neumann was a RAND consultant uh, and uh, 
influenced us a, a, a great deal. deal. Uh, Bill and Willis will talk more about uh, the Rand uh, Princeton interaction. And with that, I Uh, I'd like to do the roots part of this discussion and look back at the prehistory uh, that, of Joniak and in particular the work at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study where a great deal of the, the foundation for the work of a machine behind us was laid. In 1946, again, just at the end of World War II, uh, von Neumann, who had been familiar with the ENIAC during the war, <coughs> assembled a group at Princeton, at IAS, excuse me, uh, to build a machine for science and engineering applications. Burks, von Neumann, and Goldstein had been together at the University of Pennsylvania during the war, and they jointly wrote a document called the logical design of a digital computing instrument. Now, and I think instrument is the right word. I meant to look it up, but I, I didn't. And that logical design, spelled out in two volumes, was to be the foundation for the machine that von Neumann wanted designed. Now, the important thing about that project at IAS was that it was oriented toward science and technology issues. That was natural given von Neumann's interests. It was to be a parallel machine. It was to be as fast as the electronic art of the day could sustain. And on the other side of the street were the companies like Eckert and Mockley who were building character-oriented machines, serial, aimed at a quite different set of applications, what today we would call uh, transaction calculations or data processing. So naturally, the IAS effort came to the attention of all the groups in the country that were interested in fast S and T science and uh, science and engineering work. So we had a steady stream of visitors through the project, uh, looking over our shoulders, wanting to mimic for themselves what we had done. And among them was the University of Illinois, uh, Los Alamos. Uh, Argonne Laboratory at Chicago and Rand. So I got to know the Rand people during their visit and looking back I suspect the only one I really ever met in any depth would have been Bill Gunning. I don't think I met the others that might would have come through. But they, they looked over our shoulder, all of the visiting groups as they came through would collect the latest information, the latest things that we had done, the latest set of drawings and march out. And it's a mystery, I guess, that they didn't beat us because they were that close behind. And when I, then finally, when I finished my graduate work at Princeton, I came west in 1951, first to North American Aviation in Downey, where I learned a little something about how to make airplanes on a production line. But at that time, there was a an early predecessor of the current IEEE Computer Society holding meetings in uh, one of the temporary buildings on the UCLA campus. It was the Institute for Numerical Analysis building, where Harry Husky and others, Bill, participated, built the SWAC, and there I renewed my acquaintance with Bill and met a lot of other people, like Harry Husky and Ragnar Thornson and all the famous names. Well, by that time, the RAND effort had started, and a momentous event happened to occur. The Gunnings went skiing, and Bill came back with a broken leg. And the RAND management got immediately concerned that here was the man in charge of their effort if he were to sustain a more serious event than a broken leg, the project would be in deep trouble. So it was a natural and easy transition for me to move from the east side or the west side of town down there and to join Rand in the spring of 1952, where I've been ever since. I had grown restless at North America in any way, so it was just as well that that wonderful opportunity came along. Now, I'd like to comment 
about the IAS effort and what it exported to the technical world of the time. Now, keep in mind that the commercial electronics art was still struggling, or it really hadn't materialized, but it was struggling from the aftermath of World War II. So one didn't just go out and buy any thing that one might want by the way of components. So we built a machine out of the war surplus that we could get from the Army. And there were regular vendors that would come through who dealt in war surplus, and we'd have a shopping list, and they'd find aluminum and tubes and one thing or another for us. And that was what we had to work from. As I've commented, Burks, von Neumann, and Goldstein produced the logical design. We, as an engineering group, uh, the engineering group varied a little bit. It was five, six, sometimes four, but six, give or take one. The engineering group produced a prototype design of an all-parallel machine, and it documented it quite well in terms of drawings and progress reports. <coughs> Excuse me. But we also exported a design philosophy. All of us who were in that engineering group had lived through the war with the pulse technology of radars, uh, IFF equipment, radar beacons, and that was the technical foundation from which we went. So we built all our own test equipment uh, based on that foundation. But for the most part, those devices that I just mentioned beat the electronics unmercifully. I mean, radars typically beat their vacuum tubes with tremendous wallops of energy, and that was not the way to build a computer. So the IAS attitude was to treat the electronics as kindly as possible, and electronics meant vacuum tubes at that time. And so, all our vacuum tubes, we decided on a series of things, to run the vacuum tubes all at derating heater voltages, instead of the nominal 6.3 as they all were in those days, we ran them at 6.0 or maybe 5.9 or thereabouts. We kept the heat dissipation in all of the vacuum tubes at half of what the handbooks would specify. We derated all resistors likewise to half dissipation. We derated, marked down, so to speak, the voltage ratings on capacitors. We avoided thermal shock like the plague, so we turned all of our vacuum tubes on over a period of several minutes with a huge variac arrangement. And we designed circuits that had to function properly, even though every component would drift by 10% in the combination of worst directions. But we also exported uh, some important logical principles. All the circuits were to be direct coupled. No capacitors were to be allowed in signal pass. So circuits, therefore, would function at their inherent time constants not as determined by some artificial time scale set by an internal clock. In the lingo, the machine was to be fully asynchronous. No internal clock, no rigid timeline. So in principle, one could arbitrarily slow down any event in the machine, and it would successfully conclude the proper sequence, although, of course, somewhat slower. Another design principle was that capacitors would never be used for the temporary storage of information. So when shift registers were designed, they weren't lateral as the typical design of the day were. They were ratcheting in nature from here to here and diagonally back. So every movement of information in the machine was subject to the proviso. It would never be destroyed at its source until it was known to be safely secured at its destination. The IS machine was uh, some 12 or 1500 vacuum tubes, all direct coupled. That must be the biggest direct coupled DC coupled device that ever was done. There is, a, there is, was, of course, one place where we had to deviate from those rigid principles, that where the physics dictated the, uh, to the contrary, and that was notably in the electrostatic memory where the physics of the, screen, of the charge behavior on the phosphors of the CRT just had to 
to tie you to a time scale. Now, Paul is giving you the beginning of the, the Rand scene. I've sketched what the prehistory of the Johnny Act was and what the technology was that was exported to several places, including Rand, where Bill was in charge of the project. So the next move in this show is for Bill to talk about hardware. Thank you, Willis. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about was what we did about vacuum tubes to try to make life more bearable and longer. And uh, he's mentioned both regulating the heater voltage and uh, also turning turning the tubes, the heater uh, power on slowly and turning it off slowly. And the reason for that was that a common failure in vacuum tubes was the so-called heater cathode short. The, the, for a tube to work, you had to get this cathode, which is a little cylinder, uh, up to a red hot temperature. And to do that, there was a tungsten wire in there called a heater, and it had to be insulated from the cathode. And if you slam the power onto the heater, it will expand in how long it takes for, well, these are not incandescent lights, but how long it takes for a light to come on, a fraction of a second. But the, sle the sleeve, which was the cathode, uh, didn't heat up for uh, many seconds, as you know, if you turn on a vacuum tube amplifier. Uh, and the the problem was the differential expansion between the heater wires inside of the sleeve of the cathode. There was abrasion there, and the insulation would wear out, and you have like a heater cathode short. So we designed, I don't know if the transformers are here or not, but we had a special transformer design that allowed us to put the tubes in groups of no more than 12, and we were able to test the heater cathode leakage. Because as you watch the leakage, you get some idea of whether or not you're about to have a failed, failed, failed tube. And it was, I, I don't know where the uh, selector is on the machine anymore. It doesn't seem to be where I remember it. But it was possible to go through this, uh, this kind of analysis while the machine was running. And that saved a great deal of time in in, uh, to, in dealing with the two problems. Um, okay, let me, let me talk a little bit about some of the other uh, things that were copied from and some deviations from the IAS machine that uh, Willis talked about. And one was that in the IAS machine there uh, there was not to be any connectors. Uh, when you can put when you put two uh, pieces of wire together, they were soldered. And we took the uh, bold step of using lots of gold-plated connectors, uh, to be sure. But that that made it possible for us to get in and reach a tube that was about to fail or already had failed, uh, and that helped us a great deal. Uh, a bold step that we took, we thought it was bold, uh, was to try to get the uh, indication on the operator's console of what was the state of any of the flip-flops in the machine and to be able to set them either to one or a zero. And this meant bringing a wire out from each one of those uh, flip-flops. There are typically 10 in a, in, a, in a bay. Well, in fact, there are uh, 20, because there are the two ranks that Willis talked about in a shift register. You can shift up and shift down diagonally. Um, and, yeah, here, here are all these wires coming out. There's a big bundle, something like, uh, like 3,000 wires came out of the frame and went over to the, uh, to the console, which was made, made the wires maybe be 15 feet long. And the first test on a machine in those days was the prime number test. You wanted to see compute prime numbers. It was easy to program apparently and check. Uh, and it would run up to a certain point and fail. And you'd do it again and it would fail at the same place. And finally we tracked, tracked this down to the what we call the 30,000 ohm, the 30K effect, not Y2K, uh, because that was the the resistor that was in series with each of these wires to try to isolate the capacitance from the from the flip flop, and it didn't do a good enough job. Uh, it, and what happened then was equivalent to crosstalk in a PC board that you're familiar with at a in a modern machine, where where uh, 
it's not digital, it's really sort of analog, but you still have to, to deal with it. <coughs> and the solution was to stick a little uh, neon uh, tube in, in place of the 30,000 ohm resistor. A neon tube up to about 50 volts is pretty much an open circuit, and then it breaks down and, and will uh, allow some current to flow. And so that's the way the card machinery was coupled to the innards of the, of the machine and the way the console was was coupled. Uh, Mort will have a story about that later on. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go on to the fact that we had a uh, an enormous, well, you know, like this, motor generator in a room all by itself because it was noisy as hell. And that was an AC line filter. It had some extra inertia on the shaft, and the power in Santa Monica was uh, was not all that wonderful, uh, and so that helped a great deal. And then the last thing I want to mention is if you if you look around on the end here, if you see funny little things on a panel. Those are grasshopper fuses, which are sort of a three terminal fuse that makes a circuit if the fuse blows and allows the, an alarm to come on. And they're they're common in uh, relay. Uh, telephone switching offices, uh, and and we build a lot of those in here. Okay, um, let me say just a little bit about now going going to memory uh, about the Williams tube memory, which was the choice of most of the Institute for Advanced Study uh, copies, and the selectron memory, which and and Mort brought a copy of the selectron here that uh, we can take a look at later. Uh, I'll try to go through this fast. The, the Williams tube memory used a standard cathode ray tube <coughs> and stuck a screen on the outside of the tube at the phosphor end and ran a wire into the signal amplifier. Uh, the way it was would store information was to have the deflection set so that it could be placed at any of, if you were greedy, a thousand spots. And what it ended up with was usually 256 spots, uh, 16 by 16. And depending on what was done the last time the beam was at that particular spot, whether it wrote a second spot or just uh, wrote the single spot, would determine the charge left in that spot. And so when you came back with the beam, you could get either a, about a half a millivolt of signal for uh, a few microseconds or a much smaller signal. And that means that that was a very, very fragile uh, arrangement. Uh, typically, if you if you come into the room with a, with an I, a 701, which used Williams memory, or the SWAC, or the other machines, and flip the lights, the room lights on, uh, you had a pretty good chance of, of uh, producing a memory error. Uh, another <laughs> another problem was that cathode ray tubes were meant to be looked at, <coughs> not read, not read the secondary emission ratio off of every spot. And if there were little defects in the phosphor, it could change the secondary emission ratio and make make the that spot be a quote bad spot. And people at IAS got something like 2% yield of defect-free cathode ray tubes. And, and uh, IBM, by spending, it is alleged, a million dollars to develop a, a superior uh, processing facility, got that yield up to 60%, a, a great achievement. But it still was, you know, the room light phenomena was was an indication of how, how tricky this was. You often you would adjust the position of the raster uh, to, to straddle a defect in this tube. But since they were all in parallel, that didn't, that didn't do you. That was, a, that was a loser, too. Okay. Pardon me? Flashes from news cameras were pretty bad. I'll bet. Yeah. Any, any kind of electromagnetic flash. And, and, and the signal was right in the middle of the broadcast band, too. So you had, <laughs> if you were close to KFI, boy, that was, that was no good. Um, so what we did, since, as Willis said, we were really going for reliability, was to pick up on what was designed for the original IAS machine, the Selectron tube, which has 
digital addressing, so you don't have any analog stuff to, to find, come back and find the, the spot at which uh, the uh, information is stored. And that was intended for the original IIS machine at 1,000 bits. Uh, by the time we decided to, to go with this tube, uh, uh, it was dropped down to 256 bits. So that was, we, we had the, the machine, we, we designed it for two banks so we could get 512 words if we put in 80 tubes, 80 of these tubes. Here, here it is. And uh, the, the way it works is, I don't know if I can do this without having two, yeah, I can, I can do it. Um, they're they're in the center. Well, no, I'll, I'll try. Let me try it. Thanks. Uh, in the center of the tube are eight cathodes, and there are uh, uh, metal bars that separate those cathodes. Nine metal bars, and there are also metal bars that are going horizontally across the cathodes. So by putting appropriate voltages on those um, those bars, you can select one out of the 256 bits. The the Im information was stored by means of, of uh, secondary emission. These, there, were, there were little islets in here that are insulated, just electrically floating. But there are two stable states in, in a secondary emission thing, a high state and a low state. And you, by selecting a, a particular islet and illuminating it with electrons, you can get uh, current flowing through it, and it flowed out to into this box where there is a uh, shielded lead, a coax lead that comes through the glass, and then it went through coax into our sense amplifier. So that meant that we got something in the order of a thousand times as much energy uh, uh, for uh, for readout as a Williams tube, and it was a very uh, successful gadget. Except that it cost eight hundred dollars each. And RCA decided they didn't want to make them anymore because Jan Reichman, who and George Brown were co-inventors, um, could see core memory coming, and this was doomed. So we uh, went ahead and got enough of them to use them for about a year and a half for two years. Uh, uh, let me let me tell you one other thing about it. Uh, we went to visit the the line on which these things were built at RCA in somewhere in Pennsylvania. Lancaster. Where? Lancaster. Lancaster. And uh, they had this uh, tube sitting in a socket, sort of like this at the end of the production line. I guess there were several of them there. And there was this Tesla coil, like a cattle prodder, uh, 10,000 volts. They had it sitting there so that it was uh, the sparks would flash around on the inside. What's that for? Well, they said very often uh, clean rooms were not what they are today. They, there would be some lint or, or other foreign matter inside of this enormous vacuum tube, and that would short out an islet. But by sparking them with this high voltage, they could convert it into an OK tube by, by, uh, and, and put it in the box and ship it to us. <laughs> so that was something that we learned uh, as a way of extending the life of these tubes uh, substantially. Let me just say one other thing. This is a 40-bit uh, a, uh, machine. Each of four bays has 10 bits in it. And we built a 10-bit machine, a 10-bit slice of this machine, and were able to test the design of the control and, and the memory uh, with with selectrons, and that uh, thing we called Junior, it was it was later cannibalized, and the and the registers were put in into this frame. Well, I think I better uh, that that's the end of the hardware part. Well, I want you to observe: software always comes last. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last thing anybody thinks of. Um, the Johnny Eck was probably, outside of the SAGE system, one of the longest-lived uh, computers around. It lasted 13 years before it was decommissioned, and only because it had reached the state where it was not maintainable anymore. Spare parts were not available, uh, and uh, it was time to go. And it had a 
it was an, an extremely rich software environment for one very delightful reason. Uh, unlike the IBM machines that Rand began to rent beginning with the 701 sometime late in 1953, uh, the Joniac was a free good. It had been paid for. The only cost was maintenance. Nobody ever figured out what that was. Okay? <laughs> Nobody ever stated what it was, at least. So, essentially, it was a free good. So, unlike trying to run a problem for someone on the 701 or the 704, where you had to worry about uh, 300 bucks an hour for compute time, including checkout, uh, and, and uh, I have to remark that uh, the numerical analysis department, when I got to RAND, was unlike all of the other departments at the RAND Corporation, where the management took the big pot of Air Force money and divided it up into little pots and gave each rice bowl some rice. Numerical analysis never got a rice bowl. Our rice bowl got filled because all of the other departments took their bag of money and divided it down and said, here's your little piece. We're going to need some computing this year. And if they concluded that there wasn't any computing to be done this year, there wasn't going to be any rice in the bowl. Well, that meant that rented machines were less desirable in some sense than free goods. But there's a downside to that. The free good unfortunately wasn't compatible with anything else in the world and the world was beginning to move toward uh, the world of IBM essentially and the Air Force was beginning to acquire computers made by IBM of course and other government agencies were acquiring computers made by IBM and if you were going to do a job for an agency under contract and give them the results including the software they weren't going to be able to do anything with Joniac software. So th there, was, there was this wonderful schizophrenia around the place. So projects that were internal to RAND that had no external um, connection where you had to deliver the software could easily be done on the Joniac. And so the, the, the programming environment was, was a, a very diverse one because there were people who were uh, were interested in the machine because it was unique. There were people who were willing to devote their own personal time to doing things uh, on the Joniac because there was no real accounting ever done on the Joniac. If you wanted to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning and run the machine, nobody cared. Uh, if there was production to be run, of course, you, you, didn't, uh, you couldn't interfere with it. But if the machine was idle, it was available. And so there was an awful lot of bootleg uh, software research done. And as a result, uh, when the core memory got stuck on the machine, I have no uh, information or memory about how the machine ran, what programs were used, or even how programs got assembled on the Selectron memory machine. Uh, there seems to be no information in anybody's head every, every anywhere about, except for the first test program maybe being a uh, uh, a prime number program. What was the first application run on this machine in 1953? Nobody knows. Prime numbers. No, 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 no. <laughs> App application. I mean, was there a customer who 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 came along and wanted a, a program done on the journey? I have no idea. Uh, and I haven't been able to find anybody who does. I'm sure there's somebody out there that must remember, but I I was not around and I don't. But when I got there, the machine had a very empty head. There was no memory in it at all, and very shortly after I got there, the core memory was uh, installed. They beat it up for a while and eventually passed the acceptance test. The acceptance test was an interesting one and, and, and indicated the general reliability of the machine. The acceptance test was it had a run without a fault for eight hours. That said, the mainframe had a run for a, without a fault for eight hours, which it did. It was a very, very solid machine, and compared to the 701, which was in the room next door, the IBM 701, it had a mean time between failures of approximately 30 minutes. It may have been less than that in, in, in truth. And so if you wrote a program for the 701 and it, you, your, your estimate was it was going to run for more than a half an hour, 
every 15 minutes of your estimated compute time, you ran, you did a checkpoint restart so that the operator could remount that tape and restart the program from the point that you had last done a checkpoint. We never did that on the Johnny Act. Now, the Johnny Act didn't have any tapes to do that with, but... <laughs> <laughs> But that was irrelevant in material. It did have a reasonably sized drum. Uh, the machine went through a number of uh, uh, an, an evolution, a, a, almost a continuous state of evolution until about 1963. Um, the first part of the evolution was after the memory got installed, they installed a 12,000 word drum. Very shortly thereafter, uh, transistors became uh, the circuit of choice and so the machine was cannibalized and the first thing that was changed that I remember the, the adders went from analog tube adders to literally digital uh, uh, discrete uh, transistor adders and I can remember the, there was a great deal of worry about was the cold air that was passing through the machine cold enough so that germanium transistors would last well, they decided that 60 degrees wasn't good enough, so they knocked it down to 55 degrees. That from that moment on, you daren't be in the room with any of these glass doors open unless you had a parka on or you'd freeze to death. <laughs> I'm, that, that, that's not a joke. Uh, it, it really was, was like a, a meat locker in there with the doors open. The germanium transistors lasted very well under those circumstances. Um, Slowly but surely, about half of the logic in the machine, the shift registers, the multiply controller, or the, the multiplier control, uh, all became transistorized. Uh, but at that point, attention got uh, di diverted in, in other directions to uh, what to do with the machine. But I have to tell you a story now about uh, the bill said, you know, when they put the, uh, the neons in as, as active elements in the circuit, the uh, peripheral equipment on the machine was a high-speed Analex printer, which is a, an earlier version of a 40-column version of a numeric only is sitting back here in the corner. The 600 line a minute, 56 character, 120, or actually 144 character wide printer must be somewhere in the warehouse, but God knows where it is at the moment. Um, the card reader was an IBM collator, and both feeds were active. And the punch card output was a summary punch, which had been modified with uh, beefed-up magnets so that you could punch binary cards. And IBM had learned to do that a long time ago for the 701. And I don't remember whether it was a unique feature on this machine or, or IBM also did it on the 701, but there was something called uh, check... Uh, echo checking on the punch. And so you would punch a card and then it would go through a read station after it went through the punch station and row by row the bits got read back into the machine and they could be, if you asked it to, and then they could be compared with what you had punched so that you would verify that what you sent was what you got back. Okay. Well, very early on the Johnny Act was used to create to do the payroll for RAND, uh, at least the f first stage of the payroll. Uh, and, and I don't remember what all was involved, but it was, you know, multiplying hours by rate and, and other simple-minded things that probably were transferred over from either the CPC or even a 604. Uh, the rest of the payroll ended up on the, on the IBM 704, and I have to divert and tell you a funny 704 story at the moment. The payroll uh, was done on the 704, and it, it was a relatively small machine. It had, I think we had uh, 8K of memory initially, and so the payroll was designed to run in a minimum machine, and so the data fields were the absolute maximum, that, you know, they were minimized to the point where so you could squeeze as much data into main memory as possible. And so the number of dependents when computing your taxes somebody figured nobody's going to have more than seven, right? 
Well, a guy named Lester Ford, who was a mathematician, had his eighth dependent. <laughs> and the payroll went through, they went, the, the payroll people went through the up, uh, upgrading the, up, the entry. And that got read into the machine. And this three bit field that was left for, uh, depend, the number of dependents, and the up, the updating took place by adding. Okay, and so it overflowed into the next field, which created an illegitimate value, and the payroll came to a screeching halt that week. <laughs> <laughs>